So with that, thank you very much. And I introduce Dr. Jamie Ramsey, who is, uh, was my former colleague at Emory, and now he is at uh, UCSF. Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth was actually my fellow at Emory. Um, and there's another couple of fellows here that were my fellows at Emory. And now I have a fellow uh, from UCSF at Texas Heart. And my fellow this year at UCSF is here. And it's just an amazing thing that you at Methodist are putting on Elizabeth here. And, and I think the rest of the country needs to know about it. I think if 150 cardiac fellows in anesthesia, and I don't know how many there are in cardiac surgery, all around the country knew about this course, they'd all want to be here. Um, and I predict that's going to happen. So, um, so I was born in 1953, and it was around that time that cardiopulmonary bypass began. And it was for pediatric repairs. Uh, and then in the 1960s, it progressed to valvular repairs in adults. And towards the end of the 1960s, coronary bypass started to become common and really took over in the 1970s. So that's how long cardiopulmonary bypass has been done for. And there's been dozens, hundreds, thousands of studies on different aspects of what this does to the body. <clears throat> I wish I could tell you there are definitive answers about how to predict what would happen, uh, how to prevent the problems, um, and how to deal with them when they occur. Um, the science is not spectacular. Uh, so I'm going to give you 60 years of thousands of papers in 20 minutes. <laughs> Wish me luck. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about the mechanics, which are the circuit, the oxygenator, and the pump, briefly. <clears throat> talk about uh, blood pressure, a big deal during bypass, the flow, and the hemoglobin that's created with the hemodilution and the procedure itself. Uh, temperature and acid base, one of the favorite topics of anesthesia exams, alpha stat versus pH stat. Well, we will talk about that. Um, the brain and the kidneys, which are often viewed as the main target organs that we are concerned about during cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, and then the topics that um, overwhelm the subject of cardiopulmonary bypass, and that is the activation of inflammation, vascular permeability, and vasoplegia. Uh, Dr. Levy, my former colleague at Emory and my good friend, and also one of Dr. Le uh, Herrera's Mentors is going to give you uh, the state of the art on coagulation twice today, I think, once during bypass and once after bypass. <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk about that. So this is a, a cartoon from the, um, I, can I see this one? I'm going to have to stand by one of these to point it out to you. <clears throat> from the internet. Can you hear me if I, can you hear me? So um, heart here, this is uh, a venous cannula in the right atrium. For most cases, it's a single venous cannula, empties by gravity into a pump reservoir, the venous reservoir. There's two other things that come into the pump reservoir as a rule. Um, and one of them is a sucker pump, which is, we call it the coronary sucker. It's the suction that the surgeon uses in the surgical field. And then there's a vent pump. So if the surgeon might put a vent in the left ventricle to keep it decompressed. So these things come through plastic tubing, just the way the venous cannula is in plastic tubing, and they are actively suctioned into the pump reservoir. Okay? The reservoir is aspirated by uh, a systemic blood pump, which is your cardiopulmonary bypass pump, and it goes through a heat exchanger and an oxygenator, um, and then back to an arter arterial filter uh, into your arterial system. And in most institutions, the cardioplegia is a combination of blood taken from the circuit, from a, another little pump here, and then mixed with a cardioplegia solution and given uh, into the coronaries to stop the heart. So the reason to show this slide is all the plastic, all the tubings, the pump reservoir, an air gas, uh, a, sorry, a blood gas interface at the reservoir, uh, pumps that are compressing the blood not in the vortex of the left ventricle that you just heard about, but uh, the two kinds of pumps that we use, um, another cartoon from the internet, this is the old roller pump um, that you'll see on most cardiopulmonary bypass machines, and that's used for the uh, coronary suction and for the um, left ventricular vent in most institutions today. And when, we, when I was um, a resident, and for most of my career, we used this same kind of pump to pump the blood through the whole system and into the body. 
Um, but in the last 10 or 15 years, most places have gone to the pump on the far right, which is a centrifugal pump, which is a spinning kind of frictionless pump that aspirates the blood through the top and pumps it out through the side. Um, and the difference is that the roller pump compresses the blood, the, the, roll, the blood is going through a plastic tubing around here, and there's a metal wheel that compresses the blood to, to, to propel it forward, and that's more traumatic to the elements of the blood. So you'll find that, I think, I don't, I don't know about all, but certainly most institutions in this country have changed the main pump to the centrifugal type, type of pump. But you get the picture that there's lots of plastic, there's blood-air interface, there's pumps, there's suctions under suction. One of uh, my surgeons at uh, Montreal when I trained used to call the coronary sucker the hemolyzer. He'd say, hemolyzer up. Um, so all of these things are not things that are supposed to happen to the blood, right? Um, so you can imagine that there's lots of bad things that are associated with this that can lead to a variety of uh, pathological processes. So I'm going to quote to you a couple of uh, studies here. This is a review article published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. Just to, for the surgeon's point of view, Gene Hessel, the middle author here, was a cardiac surgeon until he saw the light and became an anesthesiologist. Uh, uh, and he's at the University of Kentucky. Um, so this is a nice review of optimal perfusion, talking about blood pressure and blood flow. On the questions that we're, we're kind of uh, facing, and this is independent of what happens to the blood itself, um, which I'm going to talk about in the last part here. This is, um, this is about the trying to just maintain perfusion to the body. So is there a relationship between the actual blood pressure on bypass and outcome? Is there a benefit to pulsatile perfusion, if we could do it? Uh, what flow should be targeted on bypass? Should we give standard flow? You know, we talk about 2.2 uh, uh, liters per minute per meter squared. Is that what we should be targeting? Or is it okay to go lower? Or should we go higher? What hemoglobin should we target on bypass? Um, so let's just go through a couple of these things. These, some of these uh, slides are from that article I just quoted with Dr. Hessel as the middle author. So this is um, what are the potential advantages of a higher blood pressure and what are the potential advantages of a lower blood pressure. <clears throat> I think I can read this one easier, so I'm going to do this. <clears throat> it can't be brought up on this monitor here? Okay. Um, so... If you are trying to maintain blood flow through constrictions in arteries, which most of our patients have, certainly in the coronaries, but in other systems with vascular disease, um, then you could imagine that a higher mean pressure on bypass, a higher blood pressure, would better perfuse diseased organs, right? Um, so the, the examples given here are hypertensive, diabetic, and elderly. Um, they could also improve collateral flow um, in tissues that are at risk for ischemia, um, and it actually allows you to give, if you're going to target a higher blood pressure, that means you can give a higher flow, uh, and maybe higher flow is better, okay? On the other hand, the potential advantages to lower blood pressures are that if you're not pressurizing the blood in a pump, it could be less traumatic to the elements of the blood. That kind of makes sense, right? Um, there might be less systemic bleeding if the pressure is lower, less bleeding from the surgical incision site that was necessary to get to the heart. Um, if, um, if there's less bleeding, there's going to be less hemolyzing from the, cardi uh, the cardiotomy section. Um, it allows the use of smaller cannulas, so smaller holes in the heart and the aorta. Um, and perhaps if you have a lower flow, everybody assumes that the blood is perfect going through these systems, but we know that it's not, that there's microemboli, micro bubbles, and all of those things get delivered to the vital organs. So if the flow is lower, Maybe there's less delivery of these bad things to the vital organs. So these are the arguments in favor of either higher or lower mean pressures. And I wish I could tell you there's a definitive answer, but there isn't. Um, uh, there's many studies that have looked at higher flows, lower flows, higher pressures, and lower pressures. And there isn't a one answer fits all. Um, and you have to think about your individual patient. Two important concepts. This is, this is medical school stuff. Um, the idea of autoregulation. So this is a cartoon looking at um, autoregulation in the normal brain. And we usually assume that there's autoregulation between a mean pressure of 50 and about 150. 
So you could say, well, if we maintain a mean pressure during bypass down uh, at 50 or 60, that should be good for most patients, right? Well, what about somebody who has a bad cerebrovascular disease or carotid stenosis that you don't want to fix? Well, maybe 50 is not quite high enough. Um, and there are some recent studies. Again, you have to put this in perspective. Recent studies and a history of 50 years of studies, so they're not necessarily the, the definitive studies, showing that the longer you are maintaining a pressure below the lower limit of autoregulation, the more likely you are to have cerebral and renal problems. Unfortunately for the kidneys, uh, their autoregulation is at a little higher pressure, so this is kind of like 80 to 170 uh, in the average patient for normal kidneys. So renal autoregulation actually requires a slightly higher pressure. Um, and when you go into the operating rooms, wherever you are, you're going to find your perfusionists are targeting pressures. Usually 55 to 75 is the, most, the number that most perfusionists will, tar will target. And that's kind of a balance of the impact of increasing flow, giving pressors, uh, and concern for maintaining autoregulatory zones. But these are, these are important concepts for you to be thinking about the brain and the kidney and how they deal with lower than normal mean pressures, let alone the loss of pulsatility. So it would seem that the usual mean pressure should be somewhere between 50 and 80. In most patients, it shouldn't need to be above 80 unless there's some particular disease process that you're concerned about, um, but maybe less than 50 is not the best number to target. <clears throat> maybe hypertensive patients, those with cerebral and renovascular disease should be higher. Uh, you have to give higher doses of pressors to get these pressures higher, and there is a downside to giving the pressors as well. <clears throat> but the bottom line is there's a large literature that fails to say thou shalt have a mean pressure of 65 in everyone. The literature does not say that, okay? <clears throat> Kidneys, kidney damage, there's lots and lots of research on kidney damage. If you get, if you were not on dialysis going into heart surgery, and after heart surgery you need to go on dialysis, the one-year mortality is really high, 60%-ish, okay? Now, is that just because of the kidneys? I'll just be, think about it for a minute. If you need to go on dialysis after heart surgery, it usually means something pretty bad has happened, right? Uh, so it may not just be a sole kidney effect. <clears throat> Many factors have been looked at for the onset, the severity, the prediction of, the treatment of, the prevention of renal failure. Um, and the studies are conflicting, like many other realms in cardiopulmonary bypass. You would think if you avoided the pump entirely, there should be less renal failure, right? Well, there were, there's been lots of studies on off-pump versus off-pump. Two very big studies published a few years ago in the New England Journal, so it must be true, right? Um, two very large studies, one from Europe and one from North America, showing that the incidence of renal failure is no different. Uh, taking both elderly patients and, and uh, less elderly patients. Prolonged bypass is bad for the kidneys. Everybody would agree upon that. Um, and most likely in most patients, it's multifactorial. And we can do many things that we think are good for the kidney, avoid hypotension. It's hard to say we need to avoid prolonged bypass. That's sort of something that everybody wants to avoid, but it's sometimes unavoidable. Um, but giving renal protective drugs if they exist, um, has not, never been shown to reduce the incidence of, of injury. Temperature, an unresolved issue, another one. Okay, so some places you'll find your surgeons want to maintain the patient at 37, some, some of you are surgeons, right? Uh, want to maintain the um, mean pressures um, um, 50 to 80 and want to do it at normal thermia, okay? Uh, and some will say absolutely not, you should be hypothermic. So hypothermia clearly reduces oxygen consumption um, and provides organ protection from low perfusion states. If you can predict there's going to be a low perfusion state, it's better that you be cold than you be normothermic. Hypothermic, hypothermia is neuroprotective and it's cardioprotective. And we all know that hyperthermia, if you have a neurologic insult at the time you're hyperthermic, it's going to be worse. So I think these studies that have been done looking at temperature I think the fair thing to say is that you need to avoid hyperthermia. If you're going to predictably have a period of low perfusion, certainly circulatory arrest is the extreme example, 
then hypothermia is probably something worth doing. But in the average coronary bypass case, where you don't expect a very long bypass time or real problems, you'll find many surgeons do this at uh, normal thermia. Uh, normal thermia, as we said, preserves all sorts of important things that you don't have to deal with um, if, if you haven't made your patient hypothermic. Now, this is the clinical studies on the effects of pulsatile and non-pulsatile perfusion, okay? Surely, the body is supposed to be perfused with pulses of blood, not just with a continuous flow, okay? You will find arguments improved on the left column and no difference between pulsatile and non-pulsatile. Very recent article, kind of compelling evidence that microvascular permeability and endothelial function are adversely affected by continuous flow, okay? Uh, and you'll find real advocates for pulsatile flow. It's not really available to us. You can't really get these pumps, um, and the, the argument is still going on. So we'll just leave pulsatile flow at, it's probably better, it's really hard to do, um, and the evidence isn't definitive, so you're not likely to see it uh, during your fellowship in most places. Our favorite topic, okay? So how should we manage blood gases, okay? Um, we measure blood gases in a blood gas machine at normal thermia. At 38, 37 degrees is where, if you just send a blood gas, it will be red at body temperature, right? But if you correct it using a nomogram, what you find out is that with hypothermia, which is what happens on bypass uh, in many cases, um, blood gas solubility increases, so partial pressures of gases go down. So if you measure a blood gas at 32 degrees, you'll find there's low CO2 and an alkalosis, right? They don't measure it. They measure it at 37 and they correct it with a nomogram to 32. So the thought has, that's been raised is, well, maybe it shouldn't be, no, shouldn't be al alkalotic and hypocarbic at 32 degrees. Maybe we should add CO2 so that it's got a normal pH and a normal pCO2 red at 32 degrees, okay? Well, hyperventilating, sorry, hibernating animals don't do that. Hibernating animals have an alkalosis and a low pCO2 when they're asleep, okay? Um, and this is the crux of this whole issue, and that is that alkalosis at low temperature preserves what's called the alpha balance between the dissociated and undissociated imidazole ring on proteins. And this state of protein regulates pH-dependent cellular processes and makes the cells work in their normal way. All right? So maintaining normal CO2 and pH when measured at 37 degrees, uncorrected, is what hibernating animals do. And that's called alpha stat, okay, for this alpha reason here. Um, and in adults, that's the approach that we take, uh, mainly for a cerebral effect, which I'll show you in one slide. If you maintain a normal CO2 measured at 32, you have to add carbon dioxide to the circuit, okay? And that's a cerebral vasodilator, right? So that's called pH stat. So in adults, we usually do alpha stat, and this is uh, four studies looking at flows targeted by the bypass pump under flow rate over here, um, and looking at the mean pressure that was maintained, and whether they used alpha stat or pH stat. Uh, and three out of four of these were done with alpha stat, and they all showed maintenance of normal cerebral metabolism and blood flow in the autoregulatory zone with low flows and uh, um, a modest range of pressures. Whereas when pH stat was, was used uh, um, and they added CO2 to the circuit, uh, coronary blood flow was directly, not coronary, cerebral blood flow was directly proportional, okay? Um, directly proportional to the flow rate. So for that reason, to maintain cerebral balance of blood flow, to not increase a lot of flow and potentially deliver um, harmful amounts of blood to the brain, um, we don't use the pH stat, we use alpha stat uh, for our management in the operating room. A Couple more topics and then I'll be done. I think I have a few minutes, three minutes. Uh, this is a graph uh, from a Toronto study looking at the incidence of post-operative stroke and the nadir of hemoglobin uh, intraoperatively. Uh, and the lower the hemoglobin, um, from about 29, uh, hematocrit of 29 down to about 20, 21, no difference. 
But as you go below 20 in the hematocrit, hematocrit there was a problem with um, increasing cerebral events. And you find that as a number that your perfusionists will be attentive to, and they'll want you to give blood, or just they'll have a protocol to give red cells to keep the hemoglobin above, um, or hematocrit above 20. Uh, this is a more recent study. This was in the New England Journal just last year, looking at a restrictive or liberal uh, transfusion threshold in cardiac surgery patients of many, many types of surgery in many centers uh, in Europe and North America coordinated from a Canadian center, um, and I put down here 7.5 versus 9.5, so they targeted 7.5 as the perioperative hemoglobin, um, and 9.5 as the um, postoperative hemoglobin versus 8.5. So they were using 7.5 versus either 9.5 postoperatively or 8.5 intraoperatively. And their conclusions, I'm not going to read to you, but the conclusions were it made no difference. Okay? So you could target a lower hemoglobin, a hematocrit of, of, of about 23 or 24, perioperatively, and have no impact on outcome. You didn't have to transfuse to a higher hemoglobin. Um, you probably remember the TRIC trial. It was a big study done in ICU, um, multiple ICUs, same question asked, same, same conclusions that you didn't need to maintain a hemoglobin of 9. You got the same outcomes if you maintained a hemoglobin of 7.5. Now, last few slides I'm going to go through quickly because there's no real data. It's kind of a summary of what's going on. This is a nice review article published in 2013 uh, in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia by Richard Hall, who I think passed away. Am I right? Uh, he's about my age. That's what happens to us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he's a cardiac anesthesiologist in Canada, wrote a very extensive review on inflammatory mediators. So what happens, we won't, don't have to show you this, what happens, yeah, I'm done in one minute. Uh, what happens when you um, put all the formed elements of the blood through this circuit that I described to you at the beginning is you activate proteins, you activate the endothelium, you get a release of a lot of inflammatory mediators, you get vascular permeability, you get abnormal nitric oxide production, and you get vasodilatation. And that's really what all of these slides are about. So what Rick Hall did was he did an extraordinary review of hundreds of papers. Uh, and he came up with three slides of this. On the left-hand side are mediators, and on the right-hand side are all the studies that have been done for those mediators. And this is slide one, figure one, figure two, and there's three more of these, okay? Huge numbers of studies, huge numbers of mediators, and they are all increased, okay? Uh, and then he did a summary of interventions, non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic interventions to try to, reduce, try to reduce the mediators. And this is an ongoing study, uh, an ongoing process of studies to understand how we can modify the mediators to modify the inflammatory response. And we don't have an answer, and we don't have any modifiers that are definitively concluded, uh, short of avoiding long bypass runs, because <laughs> uh, that's the big deal. Uh, this is another, this is a review, star, uh, re review article published in the Journal of Medical Sciences uh, looking at vasoplegia, which is the uh, difficult to treat persistent vasodilatation and vascular permeability. Um, Conclusion, exposure of blood to circuit and extensions causes activation of all sorts of inflammatory pathways, release of mediators. Surgical trauma, ischemia, reperfusion of the heart contribute in the same way. It's time-related. Vascular permeability is increased. Vascular tone and response to pressors is reduced. You're depleted of vasopressin. You're depleted of vitamin C. There's abnormal nitric oxide production. Um, and what can we do? These are things that have been tried, possibly may be helpful. We can reduce the surface area, reduce the suction, use um, coated circuits, circuits coated with heparin-like substances that can reduce the adhesion of proteins, reduce the pump, prime, uh, the pump time, escalating pressure strategies, Clearly shown that as norepi becomes ineffective, it usually means that vasopressin is depleted, so add vasopressin. And then there's novel therapies. 
this is especially for vasoplegia, things like uh, hydroxocobalamin and vitamin C, case reports to date, not definitive studies, but these are things that possibly can moderate the vasoplegia through a nitric oxide effect, at least, at least methylene blue and hydroxocobalamin. Vitamin C is responsible, uh, is, is necessary for production of catecholamines, and when vitamin C is depleted, then you don't produce enough endogenous norepinephrine. So summary, hemodilution, non-pulsatile flows, you target the pressures, not the patient's own physiology, inflammation, increased pet capillary permeability, vasoplegia, all due to surface activation um, and all the abnormal circuits we're exposed to. In most cases, organ function is reversible and mild. All of the processes are worse with prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass. And Dr. Levy's gonna tell you about coagulation. <laughs> That's all, thank you.